Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I'm Roger Altman, and on behalf of the Hamilton Project, I want to welcome you to our forum here this afternoon. Uh, We are doing uh, this event in partnership uh, with Results uh, for America, which is an initiative of America Achieves. So this is co-sponsored by the two of us, Hamilton and America Achieves. And we're here today uh, to talk about evidence uh, and using evidence uh, as a component of policy making. I'm not one of those who agrees that Washington is an evidence-free zone. So uh, we're having this event in defiance, so to, in a certain sense, of that perception. Um, but we have two great panels, uh, and I think this is really going to be interesting today. Uh, Michael Greenstone, the director of the Hamilton Project, will moderate the first panel. It will begin with an overview of the two papers that are released today. I hope you have them with you because they're available to all of you here. Um, uh, one by Jeff Liebman and the other by Lewis Jacobson. And then the panel will discuss those and the, and the overall topic. And other members of the panel include John Bridgeland, uh, former director of the White House Domestic Policy Council, the great Linda Gibbs, Deputy Mayor of New York, Michelle jo Jolin, Managing Director of America Achieves, and of course, Michael. And then Bob Rubin will moderate uh, the second panel, uh, and uh, that will focus on using evidence to drive public investment towards what works. Uh, uh, we have quite a good panel, uh, distinguished panel, uh, in addition to the first, Alan Kruger, uh, president of, the, of CEA, uh, Senator Rob Portman, Senator Mark Warner. One noteworthy thing about this topic, uh, which is heartening, I think, is that you can see by the composition of our second panel, it's a subject that uh, brings forth bipartisan interest. And in an environment where we all need more of that, uh, that's, that's heartening. So without any further delay, I'm going to turn this over to Michael, and we'll start the first panel. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, so first. Uh, following up on Roger's introduction, just point out who's who. We have uh, the fabulous and frequent Hamilton author, Lou Jacobson, uh, to my right, uh, Linda Gibbs, John Bridgeland, uh, and Michelle Jolin. Uh, so I think what we would like to begin with uh, is a discussion, uh, is to have Jeff Liebman, who's going to join us through the miracle of technology on the screen, uh, talk a little bit about uh, his paper. Hi, Jeff. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Excellent. Should I start? Please. All right, thank you. Well, thank you, Michael, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. We're in the midst of a remarkable period of improved public sector management. Innovative mayors and governors and agency heads are using data-driven strategies to reallocate funds from less effective programs to more effective programs, to improve the performance of programs that are underperforming, and to create incentives for new solutions to be developed. And let me just start by giving you three examples. So in, in New York City, uh, Mayor Bloomberg has created something called the Center for Economic Act uh, Opportunity, which is trying to come up with new and innovative solutions uh, to create opportunity and reduce poverty. And what they're doing in New York City is they are allocating $100 million a year 
to testing new strategies. And then after they uh, develop the new strategies, they rigorously evaluate them, often with randomized controlled trials. And the ones that succeed become eligible to enter into the permanent ongoing budget of the city. So that's uh, one, one example. Let me give you a second example. Uh, in Cincinnati, they've created something called the Strive Partnership, where they've brought together uh, the city government, the schools, uh, the uh, businesses and, and, and employers in, in, the, in the community, and a number of the philanthropic players in the community, all around uh, trying to have a cradle to career strategy so that every child coming through uh, the Cincinnati school system uh, reaches a, a successful outcome. And they're, they're measuring outcomes, uh, the share of, of, of children who are kindergarten ready, the share of uh, children who meet fourth grade reading standards, uh, onto a whole set of uh, graduation related uh, measurements. And, when they're, and, they're, and they're tracking this in real time. And when they find problems, so a year or two ago they found, for example, a few hundred uh, children were not meeting the, the fourth grade reading standards, they bring the community together to decide uh, how to allocate resources and how to redirect systems, to, re, to, to re, uh, organize systems uh, to uh, get back on track. And so that's a second uh, exciting example. A, a third example is the federal uh, Department of Education's I3 program, where they created three different tiers of evidence in deciding how to award competitive grants. The first tier was for proven practices that had very solid evidence behind them. And the largest share of the funds were reserved for these proven practices. The second tier was for promising programs that had some evidence, but not the most rigorous evidence. And uh, they funded, uh, to a lesser degree, those kind of programs uh, and built in more rigorous evaluation strategies so that at the end we will know whether or not those strategies worked uh, as well. And then they created a third tier to develop new approaches, uh, things that are not yet proven but that are promising, and to develop evidence about those. And so this is an example, another example of, of uh, creative use of, of evidence to do a better job of policy making. Now, I could go on and on with examples uh, like that. And indeed, in the paper, I guess I do go on and on. Um, but um, I think what all of these have in common is uh, they're data driven. They are outcome focused. It's not just about measuring the number of people served, but they're measuring uh, the outcomes, the public goals that these programs are trying to meet. Um, and they're not simply trying to decide whether what we're doing today works or not. They're also trying to create a scenario where we test new strategies uh, and come up with new solutions. So one of the top policy priorities is to continue to spread these kind of practices to more jurisdictions, more cities, more towns, more federal agencies. Um, but I also in the paper argue that there's some things very concretely that the federal government can do to increase the use of evidence in policy making. Uh, one of those is to give more agencies the authority that the Department of Labor currently has to allocate a portion, a half a percent or maybe one percent of program spending uh, toward evaluation both of existing programs and of new approaches. The second thing is to have more agencies use a tiered evidence approach like the Department of Education has done in the I3 uh, program. The third thing is uh, targets formula funding. A, a lot of federal social spending is done through formula grants that basically allocate spending to local governments and local communities based on quantitative factors like the number of the population size or the number of, of poor children, uh, but don't have a lot of, uh, there's not much of a federal lever to make sure that that money is eventually spent on proven practices. And so a third idea would be, would be to have a, a fraction of formula uh, funding uh, restricted uh, to proven practices. I also argue that while the spread of these kind of practices uh, is likely to lead to better outcomes and better results for taxpayer dollars, we have to go beyond uh, this wide di dissemination of these practices to a more strategic approach if we're really going to develop solutions to our most pressing social problems. So I propose something I call the 10-year challenge. Uh, the, what I propose is that the federal government, Congress, and the White House should come together and identify 10 social problems. Uh, retraining out of, uh, out of work uh, individuals, making sure uh, low-income children reach kindergarten ready to learn, uh, reducing high school dropout rates. They could, should come together to define 10 social problems, and then they should give 10 communities grants to test solutions to those problems with the goal of having a solution within 10 years. 
So it's 10 problems, 10 communities, 10 years. Uh, and the thinking behind this is it's going to take that kind of targeted approach at the community level to re-engineer systems, to take the various stove piped funding uh, sources and use them in a strategic way, in a data-driven way to get better outcomes for us to discover the kinds of transformative solutions uh, that can solve our social problems. The, the last thing I propose in this paper is that the federal government makes strategic use of pay-for-success contracts uh, using social impact bonds to, to target policy areas where if state or local governments take action, it generates federal dollar savings. So there are lots of things where if the, if the local governments do things, the savings come not to those local governments, but to the federal governments. And that makes it hard to get state and local governments to actually uh, have the right incentives to undertake those activities. And so by strategic use of pay for success contracts, uh, and I argue that early childhood education would be the best place to start, uh, I think we can create better incentives for state and local governments to partner with the uh, federal government in making the kinds of investments and changes to practices where the dollar savings uh, probably accrue mostly to the federal government. Why don't I stop there, Michael? Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so Jeff it can only be with us uh, for a little bit. Uh, and I just want to ask one follow-up question right from the start. You know, Jeff, you worked at the OMB. Why is it so hard for the government uh, to find out the answer to what works and then to take advantage uh, of what works? Uh, that's a great question, Michael. Um, I think there's several challenges to using evidence in policymaking. One is people have to go discover the new solutions to problems. And investing in R&D, investing in innovation is hard because often the people who come up with the solutions don't get the return to those solutions. Uh, imagine we had five different communities around the US that all tried to tackle early childhood education. And suppose four of those failed and one of them succeeded. If that one solution could be taken na nationwide, Overall, that initiative would be a tremendous success. But four out of the five would have failed in their own uh, undertaking. And so there has to be uh, support, either from the philanthropic community or from the federal government, for that kind of innovation. The, the second thing that's hard is we simply don't measure outcomes enough. Most things we spend money on, we have no idea whether they're working or they're not working. And often, the folks who are running the programs either don't have the resources or the incentives to do the uh, measurement. Uh, and so uh, encouraging measurement, requiring it or funding it is, is, is uh, essential. Uh, the third challenge is even when there is evidence out there, it's ha often hard to get governments to use it. Um, traditionally, what we do is we fund whatever we funded last year, and we raise spending by 1% for inflation or something like that. Um, but to actually go in and say, no, we're going to uh, replace what we were doing uh, yesterday and do something uh, new uh, is hard. It's politically hard. You often get uh, incumbent providers going to their legislators and, and blocking efforts to uh, change how things are being done. Um, and so uh, initiatives like the tiered evidence standards that I, that I talked about are really essential because they uh, not only create new evidence, but they also create a mechanism for using that evidence in policymaking. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you uh, for making time over technology. Okay, uh, so next up we have Lou Jacobson, the president of New Horizons Economic Research, talking about an exciting proposal on job training. Let's see if I can handle the technology. Oop. Okay, well, thank you for giving me this opportunity to discuss Bob Lalonde's and my proposal. We believe that this proposal could have a transformative effect on the ability of low-paid and dislocated workers to increase their earnings. We hope that by the end of this talk, you will agree. The first slide describes the promise of training. <clears throat> the research that Bob and I have carried out for the past 15 years indicates that if the right choices are made, training of nine months or more can substantially increase earnings. But only if the training builds skills leading to high-paying jobs in the trainees' local labor markets and is well matched to the trainee's education and background, and is sufficiently intensive and long-lasting. <clears throat> the next slide describes the reality of training. The promise of training is realized by about 25% of trainees. Those who complete high return programs, <clears throat> career and technical uh, training, that leads to degrees and certificates. Unfortunately, 75% of trainees do not realize large gains. In many cases, this is because they select programs that do not provide career-enhancing skills. 
In some cases, trainees select high return programs, but lack the academic preparation needed to complete them, rather than select one of many high return programs that do not require high levels of academic preparation. In addition, some people do not obtain enough training to make a difference. Bob and I believe that it is possible to double the proportion of trainees who substantially increase their earnings simply by helping trainees make better choices. As shown in the next slide, key, pro key problems are that most trainees lack personalized information about expected returns to training based on their academic preparation, family circumstances, and local labor market needs. They lack know-how to use data to make complex training investment decisions and lack help from knowledgeable mentors. As a result, they fail to consider the range of programs available, the expected gains from completing these programs, the probability that they will complete these programs, the costs of the programs, and how they will cover those costs. Our solution is for the federal government to hold a race to the top style competition that will put in place state information systems providing the information and guidance trainees need to make better choices. These systems have five components. Number one is assembling relevant data by building on the close to one billion dollars that, that state and local governments have already invested in creating state longitudinal databases. Number two is developing measures needed to estimate the net benefits of training, such as post-program earnings, probability of completion, direct and indirect costs. Number three is disseminating the inf information in ways that improve decision-making by tailoring the information to the characteristics of trainees and their labor markets and pro by providing career counselors when needed. Number four is measuring the effect of the systems on trainee decisions Number five is sustaining those programs that prove to be effective. I hope you can see this slide. Um, the next slide shows an example of a report card that we advocate be developed. The report card provides basic information about specific training programs, such as the cost, which is shown on the upper left-hand corner, duration, which is shown in the upper right-hand corner, the expected earnings following successful completion and how those earnings compare to the completed pre-training earnings, which is shown in the lower right-hand corner. But the most innovative element of this report card is shown in the lower left-hand corner, which displays the probability of completion, the high school GPA of completers, the academic preparation of those entering versus those completing training. Bob and I believe that the key to improving choices is helping trainees recognize cases where the returns are low, even if they complete the program, and cases where the chances of completing a high return program are low. In this hypothetical example, the returns are high with annual earnings gains of $6,000. However, the completion rate is 34%, because most completers have high school GPAs of B plus or better, while most non-completers only have a C high school GPA. <clears throat> While there's a lot of useful information in this report card, Bob and I are concerned that it would be difficult for C students who need this information the most to draw the inferences needed to improve the training choices from this information alone. That is why we advocate determining the value of tailoring the information to the characteristics of trainees and making career counselors available to help trainees make sound inferences. <clears throat> In summary, we believe that funding the best proposals states have to offer can develop information <clears throat> systems that substantially increase the returns to training. Our solution can work because training providers already offer high return programs for trainees with diverse backgrounds. Personalized information and guidance can increase the yield on training investments. This solution builds on existing data and information systems, and the solution goes beyond existing systems to tailor key information to the characteristics of trainees and their labor markets. And finally, the information will be disseminated so it improves the choices made by trainees. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to further conversation. All right.
So Lou, before we turn to the panel, I just wanted to ask you one quick follow-up. As I understand it, you have that there's a chain of effectiveness. The first is figuring out what works, uh, and then the second is to get the key people to actually exploit or use the information. And I think more than people realize, you think that that second part is really difficult. That's, that's correct. That uh, There's a long history behind this paper, as many papers, and originally, I tried to be more, a little bit more wonky and discuss some of the fine points of doing the estimation. But it turned out that the, that was premature, that the fine points are fine points. The general scope of what the mission is is what really needs people need to focus on. So there are several examples of states like Florida and Washington which have online systems where you can actually look up this information. The question is, have these systems had much of an effect? And the answer is no. And we speculate and that, well, we, we gathered from, by asking people who work with uh, count, um, uh, people who need training, what's the problem here? And basically the problem is that they don't really know, they don't have a lot of experience in using data to make very complex decisions. And I think the, the thing that I would like to impress on this audience here is that we all, I believe, went to college and some of our kids went to college and did reasonably well. And we don't realize how complex the decisions are. There's a zillion things that you need to know in order to be successful in college that if you're the first person in your family ever to step foot on a college campus, you wouldn't know. I'll give you, give you a simple example. <laughs> that many people don't realize that when you have an open enrollment institution like most community colleges, that doesn't guarantee you a slot in every course you want to take that, that we all know from long experience, that you have to find out the minute you can register. And you get online and you register for those courses you need. Some people have no idea that that's true. And that's just one example of the whole, as you were saying, enormous chain of things that have to go right in order to um, be successful on a, in, a, in, a, in a career program. Hey, thanks, Lou. Uh, so what we wanted to do was to use the two papers as kind of a jumping off point. Uh, and when I was thinking about how when we were thinking about how to frame this panel, there's an element in which this is kind of a, a silly thing to do. Like, uh, you could come up with about a zillion reasons for why you would actually want to use evidence uh, in decision making. You know, the list of social problems is very large. There's low rates of social mobility. There's stagnation or decline in wages for many people. The K-12 system isn't working in the way we would like it to work. Uh, we don't know what are the cheap solutions to climate change, and on and on and on. Uh, and so when you marry the need for answers to uh, really kind of astounding advances in both data collection and in computing power that can identify almost a needle in the haystack for when something works and when it won't, uh, you know, all those are kind of, those reasons are pointing towards well, we should have more evidence. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the government is entrusted with the taxpayer's money and there's always a desire uh, to serve the taxpayers well and not spend money on things that don't. That's even more true in this period uh, of budget austerity in the coming years of budget austerity. But I think the important thing to note is despite all those pushes towards using more evidence, to a first approximation we really don't use evidence uh, in decision making. And so what I want to, would hope would come out of this conversation uh, is the answer to the questions of uh, how can we do this better in terms of identifying the winners? The papers were very helpful, so the winning programs that we should focus on. Uh, what are the practical and political barriers uh, to using evidence for better policy making? Uh, and what are the limits of using evidence? Uh, when, uh, when might we want to, when is that not such a good idea? And so for that, I thought we would start with John Bridgeland, who worked at the OMB uh, under uh, George Bush and uh, was also uh, the chair of the Domestic Policy Council. And so as I understand it, John, you had something of a religious awakening when you were uh, co-chairing a, uh, about evidence, right? Uh, when you were co-chairing a White House panel. Well, I can't help myself. I read every word of Jeff and Lou's papers um, and I, I both read every word and enjoyed every word and it's rare you do both. Um, and Roger Alt Altman's right. Um, Increasingly, we're clearly not in an evidence-based zone, and I just I can't help myself on um, Lou's presentation. You know, there I think the power of it is there are 29 million middle-skilled jobs in the United States right now in search of qualified workers for these sub-baccalaureate degrees, and the idea of re-envisioning career and technical education in the United States 
uh, not only to train people for those jobs, as other countries are doing so successfully, but actually to provide data to students, to parents, to institutions, and to employers that links um, transcripts with wage records. So you can actually chart performance across programs to see, as a student going into some program, if I want to be a registered nurse, is this program actually going to lead to a successful placement um, in an available job at a decent wage? So I'm completely taken by your presentation. I just had to mention that. Uh, my first alarm bell in government, I, I was director of the White House Domestic Policy Council and was asked to co-chair the White House Task Force on Disadvantaged Youth. And um, we were looking across the system at to what degree was the country helping to boost the life prospects of 15 million young people who were at risk of not reaching productive adulthood. And we discovered there were 339 federal programs across 12 departments and agencies spending $223 billion every year to help this population. You know, one question, what, to some extent, for some of the programs, evaluation was built into the DNA, but for many of them, we couldn't identify program uh, evaluations or levels of effectiveness or even determine whether individual programs were going to achieve outcomes for this population, maybe outputs, but not outcomes. Second, I always kind of would love the thought of portfolio budgeting. Maybe Kathy Stack will, uh, will uh, heave and haul, but the idea that the government, instead of being silo and program and um, uh, department driven in terms of its approach, looking at a vulnerable population and uh, looking at how across government you could use data and evaluation and then resources to help serve that population. Um, interestingly, in every single domestic policy briefing with the president, he would ask four questions and you knew they were coming. One, is this program going to achieve the results as advertised? Second, um, who's going to manage and run this program? Third, what are going to be, what, what's the, the system of accountability for results and how is that program manager and the program itself going to be held accountable over what period of time? It led to a system called PART, if I think I have the acronym right, the Program Assessment Rating Tool, is that right, Kathy? Where um, basically it was a diagnostic tool within government for OMB to look at about a thousand programs, to look at their purpose, their design, their management, and their accountability for results. I think the good news, GAO determined that it did improve um, the alignment of resources with performance in terms of what got funded within government. And the good news also was, you know, programs that were doing better got more resources. You know, we often talking about the, you know, cut, <laughs> cut part of the, the equation. Um, I think also uh, the danger of it though was it didn't, it wasn't a collaborative tool with the Congress. So it wasn't something that shaped congressional appropriations in ways that, that it ought to have done. Uh, final point I'll make is I think uh, the power of data has to point toward solving big national problems. And I loved your example of, uh, uh, of Jeff's example of 10 communities, 10 problems, 10 experiments or innovations. We have in the country right now a 10-year goal of high school graduation rates by the class of 2020. And we worked together with Colin Alma, Alma Powell and assembled educators, policymakers, and community-based organizations around what evidence tells us every step of the way will help keep young people on track to graduate from high school. And I promise to close with this. Four presidents have now set the goal of a 90% high school graduation rate by a time certain, and three presidents have missed it. But because we have a stronger evidence base and because we have collaboration across the sector, and to your point, because we have laboratories of innovation from New York City to Shelbyville, Indiana, that tell us the elements of the secret sauce of what's actually working to keep students on track. Just a month ago, we issued the Powell Report showing that for the first time, the nation's on pace to meet its high school graduation rate. And those little rays of hope uh, are things that I think um, uh, can help inform and, and continue to support this data-driven, performance-based environment. Too long, sorry. No, no, that's great, thank you. Well, Linda, I think you're the ray of hope. Uh, New York has been incredibly successful, I think, uh, around the country and around the world. I think people have looked with admiration uh, at the way New York has both collected data, analyzed data, and used it to affect decision making. But, I suspect it wasn't always, uh, not every step has been very easy. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what some of the things you've done and the challenges that had to be overcome? Yeah, and, and um, 
I'll be very honest, we haven't figured out the secret, secret sauce, but, um, but we're very much um, committed to trying, and I think that's really what, um, what I have to share. Um, as a, with a little bit of background, I, um, I've um, worked in two social service agencies in, in New York City on the government side before I moved to my current position in City Hall, now supervising the Health and Human Services. So first I worked in the Child Welfare Agency, where quite frankly, I learned, um, I learned to love data if you wanted to actually think about how you could produce better outcomes for kids. Because when we got there, that place was a mess and we, didn't, you know, we could barely figure out you know, where the files were, um, much less how the kids that were, whose lives were in those files, how they were doing. And so, um, um, but I spent six years there, then I spent four years in the city's homeless service agency. And so when um, the mayor in his second term did a bit of a reorganization and created a deputy mayor for health and human services, um, you know, he, was, he talked to a number of us and, um, and I just decided, you know, well, listen, if you want the job, just tell the guy, right? Don't be shy. And so I said, well, you should do this, you should do that. You should throw in cor corrections, probation, and juvenile justice because they need the social services. So I sort of, you know, and I said, and if you're looking for somebody to do the job, I'll do it. And um, he says, well, thanks for that. And I'm like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> that wasn't a great, was it, you know? <laughs> so, but, you know, but long and short of it, um, he asked me to do the job, which I was thrilled. But part of the reason I was really um, compelled to, to want to do it was, um, was to, to help these colleague agencies to actually collaborate around shared problems. You know, a homeless commissioner supervises homelessness, but is really interested in solving homelessness. A child welfare commissioner is protecting children, but really is looking at the broader family dynamics with the hope that children won't be harmed in the first place. But the tools to do that really require the whole range of agencies, um, each bringing their own skills and resources and acting in a collaborative way and pairing up their, um, their strategies. So the way that this sort of got embodied in an action plan in the second term of the Bloomberg administration was through the creation of our Center for Economic Opportunity, which was this, um, it's a sort of research and development shop where um, we put in $100 million a year, and that's a mix of public dollars um, from city government, but also um, private philanthropic dollars, and that was really important for, you know, we widened the sort of the constituency of partners working on this issue and, and sort of linking elbows around it. And, um, and the basic idea was, um, we looked at the numbers in New York City, much like the nation, um, big drop during the welfare reform years in, um, in poverty, in um, increase in employment of mostly, on, on, if you looked at the um, single-headed household women, um, big jump in employment, big drop in poverty of those households, which meant you saw a big drop in child poverty. But um, you know, in the, in that, the benefits of that had sort of, um, um, sort of petered out by the early um, 2000s, and we weren't seeing changes from there. And our question was, what we've got to do something different. It's great that it came down, but it's not good enough, and we have to figure out what's going to be different. So the idea was, let's invest in a bunch of ideas. Um, you know, of course, we had a big collaborative process where everybody threw their ideas on the table, but let's pick out a range of ideas and test them. And, um, and the mayor is, um, is great, and he's skeptical, and, and you know, he gives you a hard time, and, but he's willing to do things if he feels like there's a strong theory, and then, um, and, you know, you don't have to have evidence already on everything. If you got a little evidence, you know, it worked here or there, that's good, but he doesn't demand evidence. What he really demanded was the, um, was the rigor of accountability on the implementation of the programs to know whether or not they work, and he was willing to put dollars into evaluation, because by the way, it costs money. About 10% of our total investments have been into the evaluation. And so, um, so what we've done over that period, um, we created an office whose job it is in City Hall to work with all the agencies. So the individual agencies are administering um, the portfolio of about 40 to 50 programs. The evaluation team um, first just helps get them off the ground but more importantly, we work um, both internally um, doing evaluation plus work with external evaluation partners. And what we've done um, over about, it was about four years into the process where we graduated some of the programs as successful, um, basically saying the evidence is in, it's working, it's good enough that we are going to sort of, you know, give you your money and set you free. You can have it in your, you know, you're now part of the, the permanent um, portfolio in your agency. Um, or 
um, I'm sorry, it was a great idea, and you gave it a good college try, but it didn't work. We're going to take that money away, we're going to close that program, and we're going to reinvest the dollars. And so over these, um, these eight years, we've, um, we've had three, we've had two graduations, so to speak. We had two um, rounds of successes and um, closures, I hate to say failures, um, and we're about to do our third. And what that does, um, both it, um, it allows the, sort of the, the knowledge from that research to help inform the agency's portfolio, so they have you know, here you know, lessons of what works, um, but it also gives us a chance to free up dollars to try new things. And so um, in about um, two weeks, we'll be announcing a, a set of three new initiatives that we will be investing in that are iterations off, sometimes off of prior failures. Um, but are, um, are trying out new ideas um, driven by the knowledge that we've gained, driven by the resources that um, we're able to, to bring, whether that's new resources or reinvested dollars, but with, entirely with this, this culture of um, data, managing by the numbers and accountability, um, and knowing that there's a consequence. Um, and that, you know, yes, we'll give you a second chance, but we're probably not gonna give you a third chance. At a certain point, you just to say, you know, you gave it a good try, but that's it. And so, this is um, this this office um, has done that work, but I've actually seen, and we can talk more about it later. If there's you know a question related to it of how that actually starts to change the culture out in the agencies as well. So one quick follow-up question. Now, as you said, sometimes these things don't work out, and I think oftentimes that can be a complicated thing and make uh, administrators risk averse to try new ideas. And how did you overcome that? You know, you have to. I think you have to give people room to fail. You have like, um, like trying and failing is um, is okay. If you're if you really want to innovate and you want to um, give people a chance to um, to be creative. Now, you know, obviously not every kooky idea is worth trying, and I've seen a lot of them. Um, but you know, so you, you got to give. You know, you really have to invite that kind of creativity, and you're going to shut it down if you um, if there's you know if you you know if you fire somebody if their program idea doesn't work. You really, I think, um, I actually think that if we had 100% successes, it probably means we didn't take enough risks. And you know, it's really in the risk taking where you can learn. And, and I have to say, the first time we did our conditional cash transfer program, um, I would say maybe a good 85% of it didn't work. Now, the, the post in New York, our, um, you know, the one who um, loves to hate government the most, um, oh, you know, you know, debacle, total failure, boy, did they screw up, aren't they fools? Um, you know, I look at it much differently, and we're actually now replicating conditional cash transfers in New York and Memphis, um, where we take the lessons of that big project, what were the kernels of knowledge that we got out of it about how to make this kind of thing work in, in the US, and we're replicating those pieces in New York and Memphis. So we, we draw, we also, you know, so failures can be successes. Thank you. Uh, so next we have Michelle Jolin, who's the Managing Director of America Chief. Uh, Michelle, I, you have a very uh, checkered and interesting background. <laughs> <laughs> Many uh, in the philanthropic sector, government, uh, NGOs. I wonder if you could talk about the key role for philanthropic organizations. Absolutely. And I have to say, listening to Linda, um, it, that's just an amazing story. I think what they've done in New York with CEO, and it's the kind of thing that we hope could happen at different agencies, at the state, local, and federal level. Um, but we all know, those of us who've worked in government, that government largely can be risk averse. And so I think that's when you're asking the question about philanthropy, that's a good role for philanthropy in partnership with government to um, help uh, take some of those risks and to sort of deflect some of the heat that can happen when you have those kind of, kind of um, failures. So I think philanthropy can play a couple of key roles. Um, I think one is obviously, building a pipeline of organizations, interventions, programs that have some evidence that they're working and show some promise that they can make more of a difference in, in, in the lives of children and families and communities. Um, I think there's also a key, key role philanthropy can play in funding evaluation. As Linda said, it's not free and it's not cheap. And um, it can get cheaper with these larger data sets and with, um, with more publicly available information and data. But it's still to do rigorous evaluation to do rigorous, um, uh, to, to get rigorous evidence, it's expensive, and so I think that's an important role for philanthropy. I think also um, at finding finding what's working outside of communities, especially at the federal level. I think this is less true in the, at the local and state level, but 
the federal government can be obviously um, removed. And so for that reason, having um, you know, philanthropy identifying you know, potential um, uh, programs, initiatives, ideas that could work is a really critical role. And then also just, um, you know, and I think again, as, as, as example, um, Linda gave the partnership between philanthropy and, and government can be so important in terms of deflecting um, risk, helping make better decisions internally, um, and, and um, sharing some of the, um, the costs of, and the challenges of doing that. I just wanted to say one other thing about, about this discussion, because I just wanted to, 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 to throw this out there in case this doesn't get touched on, is I think it's important to think about um, evidence and evaluation um, as a continuum, that there's, you know, at the earliest stages in innovation, um, it's a lot about data, it's a lot about collecting data and, and anecdotes and sort of getting a sense of what works. But at, over time, we know that it's critical that um, for government, at least, to invest more dollars in scaling something, there needs to be better evidence. And so the spectrum goes from sort of the earliest stage of innovation, the, the, the kind of evidence needs to be collected, to um, a larger, you know, more rigorous evidence over time. And I think that the way that the um, Obama administration has structured a number of initiatives um, over the last couple of years has been very focused on both that tiering of evidence, um, which gets to the issue of earlier stage innovation, you know, so you can get less money at that early stage, but in the evidence you're required to sort of get those resources is less, and up to a, a, a more, um, a higher level of standard of evidence um, for things that will get more dollars over time. And that was what Jeff was talking about with I3. Um, the sort of tiered evidence idea, sort of promoting this continuum that over time we need to be incenting these organizations, these initiatives, these programs um, to um, develop more evidence. And I think that's a really key role that philanthropy can play too, with sort of each of these stages and pushing that, incenting that. Thank you. Uh, so I now wanted to just pose a question to the whole panel. I think so far the way we've been talking about it, there's always a clear objective that each program is trying to achieve measurable, and then we have in mind some cutoff for if it's above or below that margin, then it's a good program or an unsuccessful program. But one thing from my uh, brief stint in government that I grew to appreciate was programs often have many goals. Uh, some of them are less well-defined than others, and some of them are less amenable to measurement than others. Uh, and I wondered if all of you could talk a little bit about how evidence, what role evidence can play in those settings. Uh, or is it, or alternatively, should it just be, if you can't measure it, then we should get rid of the program? Just put that out there and be provocative. You know, I, um, I think part of this challenge is also, and as Michelle um, said, you know, a lot, of, um, a lot of data in program evaluation is new. <laughs> when I started in child welfare, there, you know, the systems weren't automated. We didn't know what the outcomes were. We didn't know which nonprofit agencies were producing good outcomes and which were bad. And the first time that we published, we actually did an evaluation. The first time, it, um, the, they, the foster care agencies got listed in the New York Times by their grades. Um, those that, the hotshots who thought they were the top of the heap found like some of those, you know, those little guys who they didn't spend much time paying attention to above them. There was shock. That just totally reverberated through the, through the field. And, um, and, you know, and so I guess the, the, um, the point is we're, we're getting better and we're knowing more. But I think we have to be cautious about thinking that the data is going to tell us everything, particularly while we're in this learning phase. And I think that um, that another part of the challenge is that the the organizations that are going to be able to be really good at their data are people that are going to be big and strong enough that they can hire you know a, a big staff of IT and QA people. And um, in the social services, which are in you know job training as well, it's um, it's mostly delivered by nonprofits. And if you wind up um, having everything hinge on certain um, data elements, you're gonna wind up discouraging um, small startups, you're gonna wind up discouraging um, culturally diverse organizations um, that are more neighborhood based. And you gotta think about what your array of services um, are that you want and their ability to um, produce at the levels that the sort of a data-driven system, um, produce data at the level that data-driven systems are, are expecting. And so I think we just have to be mindful of how we're going to blend um, qualitative assessments together with our quantitative assessments. Yeah, I think that's beautifully said. I would just add that I think um, we can't create an environment where we're using evidence and performance-based metrics to um, eliminate programs. One, the evidence base isn't sufficient in many, many cases. 
And two, I think we want to create an atmosphere and a spirit of, of learning and building on an evidence base and helping programs succeed. I'll give you one example. It's so interesting. There were these, uh, I was on President Obama's White House Council for Community Solutions, and the, the focus population were these 6.7 million young people who were disconnected from school and work. They cost the taxpayer $93 billion a year if we don't reconnect them. And we discovered this extraordinary program called Youth Opportunity Grant that were given to 36 communities where disconnected youth were disproportionately found across the country. And because at the time in the mid-2000s, there wasn't a sufficient evidence base and a national you know, longitudinal study showing the effectiveness of these grants, the program was terminated. And then two years later, the Department of Labor commissioned an independent evaluation of youth opportunity grants. And guess what it found? That in most of these communities, it, ha it was successful in reconnecting disconnected youth to school and work, particularly with respect to uh, uh, young people of color. And um, so that's just a good example of the dangers of moving too quickly the cut based on a lack of a sufficient evidence base. And um, uh, I wish we had that program back today because it could do a lot to, to help that population. I I actually have a slightly different view on this issue. Is first, I think that government programs' goals should be very clearly defined, and that the idea that there are, multi there are multiple goals, but some of them are more important than others, and you actually mentioned one of them. We want to get the high school graduation rate up. We want to get the college graduation rate up. That's a good goal. It's like going to the moon. Either you go to the moon or you don't go to the moon. And the other issue that I think this is an inside the beltway issue, which I think is really important is that people outside the Beltway, some, some of these people are in New York, if we ask the people running the programs, they can tell you what's going on. They could evaluate them probably better than the people inside the Beltway, but nobody asked them. And I think that OMB did make an attempt relatively recently to actually define the mission of every agency and try to get metrics that would match its mission. Now, my understanding is that this didn't go anywhere. But it's a noble venture, and I think, that, I think that it's not all quantitative data that's necessary, but I think that educated opinion of people who are actually running the programs can be much more valuable than people expect. And I think that, that we have to really face the fact, that, as, as people were saying, is that we need freedom to fail, and that if the program isn't working effectively, we need to change it or get rid of it. <laughs> and, and I think from inside the Beltway, it's hard to do. A lot of times you don't have discretion to get rid of a program. You can't eliminate child protective services. You can't eliminate, right? right? You have right. to do it. And the question of how to, how to improve really is um, a question about, um, you know, you, you can create competition uh, among providers, but ultimately you're moving a whole system and you gotta think about how the, the data can educate and create um, sort of a, a virtuous loop of information so that people are progressively changing, improving practice as you go along. So let me just pick up on this theme. There, I think there's a view, though, that in some sense evidence is closely related to cost-benefit analysis, and that cost-benefit analysis at times has kind of been used as a Trojan horse for getting rid of government programs, and partially under the guise of uh, extraordinary focus on the things that are measurable uh, and uh, ignoring the things that are not measurable. Is there a way, you know, how to get the message out that evidence is okay? You know, in some, you know, in some cases, doing the right thing is going to cost more money. I mean, this is the, you know, if you, wanna, if you want more kids to graduate, not just have a high school with a high graduation rate so you shove the kids out, but if you want all the kids to graduate, that means you're going to have more kids in school and it's going to cost you more money, right? And so it, there's not, doing the right thing and good in, getting good outcomes is not always going to produce a saving. But there's also a ton of waste in our programs because we're not driving decisions based on knowledge about the best outcomes. Yeah. There's also the issue of the long-term um, payoff of some of the things that work. And so you could have a more expensive intervention like the small school example in New York City where individually the, the cost per student was higher temporarily, but the longer-term outcomes were, were stronger than other programs that were less expensive. And they graduated from high school, went on to get jobs and got um, uh, you know, uh, paying taxes and, and, and contributed to society in a way. So in that case, it was worth it because of the, the longer-term outcomes. But I was, I was going to say that one of the things that differentiates the two papers, and I thought Jeff's paper was really excellent, but it really focused on the internal management of the government. But my paper actually deals more with how you get people to vote for programs that they actually like. 
And I think there's a lot to be said for doing more of that. And the government's effect, most effective role would actually be in disseminating information. So people who go to college with Pell Grants, which is a voucher, they may, may, they may make good decisions or they may not, but there's no real organized effort to, make, to improve their, their decisions. The same thing with charter schools. In around 2000, charter schools were supposed to take over the public school system. But we now know that the decisions that the parents are making may not lead them to go to the best charter schools or the best schools in their, in their city. And the reason for this clearly is that the people who are making the choices either are constrained in ways that the programs don't really take into account, or they just don't have the transparent information they need. And needless to say, uh, we recently observed in the Great Recession that people who buy mortgages, um, people who uh, take out mortgages, do seem to be misinformed about their own personal risks. So the area in which I would like to see the government do a lot more is actually provide objective and unbiased and accurate information and help people who are the beneficiaries of the programs make better choices themselves. Yeah. Uh, building on that point, we, uh, we created something called the What Works Clearinghouse. It was, um, in the early phases, there, it was so uh, traumatic in a way, people were calling it the Nothing Works Clearinghouse. <laughs> but it, it, it eventually uh, did, through the meta-analyses and the various uh, work that was done, started to post programs that could give you confidence, not just the government, but the field that these were, you know, Michelle talked about philanthropy, that, that, that these are programs that were worthy uh, of investment. Another point, you know, I think it's a fundamental role of government to collect and report good data. And because it's the gold standard of data collection, it can do it, you know, all across the country. One quick example, um, you know, using government data sets, this genius Bob Balfance discovered there were now 1,424 dropout factory high schools where we're disproportionately losing most of the young people to the dropout challenge. And so now we're working with the Department of Education to chart the feeder, middle, and elementary schools. So with early childhood efforts and other efforts across the system, we can actually target in and focus in our efforts where the problem is disproportionately found. And you know, the simple act of government making that, ava that data available is having profound effects on how the field is organizing. And I think that's something that's worthy of further discussion. Okay, uh, so one of the things when we were planning this event uh, was we knew that we loved evidence, uh, but we weren't sure that everyone else loved evidence. Uh, and it turns out we have this incredible audience here, and it would be a mistake not to take advantage of you guys. Uh, and I want to open the floor to questions. Sure. And uh, please state your name. And your My name is Clint Brass, and I work for the Congressional Research, but I'm not speaking on behalf of the Congressional <laughs> Research Service. Um, I, so Professor Liebman outlined a few uh, challenges at the outset, and you all have identified some uh, challenges. I wonder if there's another one, and that has to do with some of the rhetoric in the What Works movement, where there are key questions of external validity, where what may have been found in one study may not readily apply to other geographies or situations. And I wonder if uh, calling something like that proven uh, might set up some false expectations or uh, eventually uh, run into some difficulties. Thank you. Your reactions to that. Yes, ab absolutely. I mean, um, and it's interesting because um, we, we faced this challenge a little bit in New York City. So we, we had these, you know, these 40 or 50 pilots that we were doing not citywide in all cases. In fact, not citywide in most cases, just in a neighborhood. And then we're like, oh my God, this is brilliant. I can't believe how great this is. And we're ready to like, you know, pound our chest and tell the world that we have the solution. Um, but of course, you know, is it going to work the same in, in, um, in a rural area as it works in an urban area? Is it going to work the same with a Latino population as it works with an African American population? You don't know that. And so it was great that so we, um, the social innovation funding from, um, from the White House allowed us to do a replication of our five most promising programs in, um, in different mixes and matches in eight different cities. And so we're doing exactly that. And, and so we're careful, the whole premise of that is it worked in New York, 
We want to try to see if these are ideas that can work elsewhere. Let's, let's try them out in other places, watch them in the same way, and then if some stuff starts working in multiple places, well then maybe you have something that you can really talk about scaling. I want to build on that and actually brag on Senator Portman, who will be here in a minute, we hope, who, who on the drug issue, when it emerges the biggest issue in his district, um, had the instinct, let's not just try to do something at the national level, let's use our congressional leadership to get community collaboration. It's almost like a, a model for collective impact in the early 90s where let's, let's use incentives. And he went on to write this bill called the Drug Free Communities Act that actually fostered community-based incentives for community collaboration across sectors and across programs and was very um, tailored to the indigenous environment. And that in turn helped inform federal policy in a way that gets to your point in recognizing that not all communities are the same and the federal response can't be unified and mandated in a, in a, in a way that, that doesn't take account of those uh, differences in local communities. But the data and evidence can be used to inform over time, right? It's a back to the continuous learning um, point that we were talking about earlier, that it's, a, it's, a, it's an important tool for policymakers to make better choices. If, if, if I could just... I wanted to, you know, I was picking on your checkered past, but by that I meant that you uh, work with the setting up the Social Innovation Fund, uh, you work in nonprofits, you've kind of seen the evidence world from many different perspectives. Do you want to talk a little bit about how the Social Innovation Fund was thinking about uh, this problem and helping your city? Yeah, so, so originally it was, um, the, the idea behind it was a recognition, this came from, from President Obama and, and the First Lady's um, uh, past and, 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 and interest in working at the community level, recognizing that good ideas come from outside Washington and it's hard to get those ideas fused into the federal government given the distance and the barrier. And so um, the way the Social Innovation Fund is set up is that it funds intermediate organizations that are local, um, entities, foundations, community foundations, um, other organizations, many of whom are here actually, because um, they were they were in town today. Um, that and from there they identify what they think has promised in communities, ideas that that, that could potentially be scaled and, and spread more widely, um, and provide the resources to them to do that. And then there's a there's an enormous matching component, which I know is it was was initially seen as a, as a huge benefit politically, and I think in practice it's it's a challenge. Um, but um, the, every um, government dollar is matched three to one from the private sector, and so there's a big private investment in making this successful locally as well. So that was the original thinking behind the, the Social Innovation Fund, but many of the, the, the ways in which it was designed went on to sort of inform other things that the government is doing now in terms of evidence and, and thinking about and, that. And to Jeff's paper, I think one strong feature of it was that the funding didn't have to be taken away from some other pre-existing program. It was there just to learn. That's right, yeah, and it's, 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 it's at the Corporation for National yeah. Service and was part of the Kennedy Serve America academic program. Uh, one is coming. Um, I'm Mitzi Wertheim with the Naval Postgraduate School. I turn out to be interested in everything. John Dewey was my godfather, oh. which is why I'm really interested in education. Yeah. I guess I want to ask two questions. Um, in the federal government, getting collaboration to happen is really painful and really hard. And my other question turns out to be about leadership. I heard the uh, superintendent or whatever her title is from Newark speak the other day about what she's doing with that school system. And as I understand it, she was appointed six weeks before the new school, school system started. And she went around and um, interviewed all the principals and there were, she ended up firing three. Of the two that, two that she, fired, they were really at the bottom of the heap. And when they got new leadership, these schools really did much better. So my question is about how does leadership play into what you're doing? And also, what can you tell the federal government about how to create collaboration? Okay, so uh, there's only uh, six minutes left in the whole panel. Uh, and those were open-ended questions. Would anyone want to try and take a first stab and then we might see what other questions are out there. It's a very important question, but one that we could probably have a whole day on, I think. On the leadership question, I think they're clearly, in terms of um, how data and evidence can be used, um, used effectively, used as a learning tool, um, not used as a club to, um, to, to um, beat programs up, cut programs, and then to sort of create disincentives for programs to be 
um, uh, willing to evaluate and, and use data. Um, I think all those things are important parts of how um, at the federal level, um, and I assume at the state and local level, a, a leader committed to this could um, you know, be using in sort of data and, and, and evidence for, for better results and, and better purposes. I think it's very true in the nonprofit sector as well. Um, making a commitment to figuring out what works about your program is incredibly risky and it takes, it takes a lot of um, leadership. Uh, many programs, as they go down this path of figuring out what works, discover very mixed results. Um, they discover some of the things that they're doing are incredibly powerful. Many of the things that they thought were working aren't working. And that's a hard, um, a hard thing to obviously discover. It, it takes a leader um, both you know, to, to convince a board to invest resources in that and then a team to sort of stop because these are obviously programs with well-meaning intentions and, and people who have committed their lives to you know, making um, you know, lives better for children, families, communities. And so to actually take on um, a hard, rigorous, um, disciplined effort to figure out what is it about what we're doing works um, is, 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 is you know, truly leadership. So Linda, is that why in New York, just for the reasons Michelle's saying, is that why in New York you created this separate entity to house all the crazy experiments and so it would be safe for nutty stuff to happen and away from the rest of the program, from the you know day-to-day -day bread and butter? You know, it wasn't the reason, but it, it became a benefit. Um, the, the reason we created it was that we just would have an infrastructure to do the, um, the, the data and the accountability, but it, it, really, it really did create um, a, 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 a safer place um, for, for you know, things a little bit more out, um, out of the ordinary to be done. Um, but I really like I, 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 uh, um, what, um, what you, you shared about the president's questions. What is it? Um, is there evidence? Yep. How is it getting? Who's going to ma manage? Who's going to manage it? Right. Is and there an accountability? Account I, that, I thought those were really critical. And one of the things that we did was um, was to create um, a delivery structure in our initiatives um, that were very much about leadership of um, of the individual initiatives. And the fact that we had that team there allowed us to kind of, if we saw things like, you know, maybe the commissioner looked the other way for a while, you know, we, they were, we were there to catch them quick um, and sort of bolster them back up or, you know, smack them around a little you know, to get things back on track. And, and I think that was really um, valuable and it taught me a lesson about thinking around, um, you know, sort of how, how from a central point of view, White House, City Hall, you know, governors, um, the Capitol, um, how it, uh, that kind of accountability delivery teams can be really important if the executive wants his agenda um, um, completed. Okay, I think we have time for one last question uh, from John Barron. Thanks, I'm John Barron with the Coalition for Evidence-Based Policy. Um, uh, I guess my, uh, I agree and strongly support a lot of what you've done in New York and a lot of the, uh, a lot of the proposals here, the tiered evidence initiatives and so on. I guess my question is, um, uh, there are a lot of this talks about ev building evidence over time, moving things along the continuum, as you've talked about, and creating incentives for the use of evidence-based practices. And as Michelle just mentioned, there are a number of, when rigorous evaluations are done, a lot of times, probably most of the time, they find that what's being evaluated didn't produce meaningful impacts. Um, but there are a few cases where there are large definitive studies, multi-site randomized trials that have shown very large effects mm. for very simple interventions. Um, there was an experiment done by Bridget Long and uh, uh, at, the, uh, at Harvard uh, at H&R Block offices that greatly streamlined the process for college financial aid application that had a very large sample and it showed a 29% increase in college enrollment and persistence in college at the four-year follow-up which was just published. There are other examples like MDRC's study of career academies also showed a large sustained increase in earnings. My question is why, I mean, there is all the value of the process, but are there a few immediate things we can do where we know it works, where there are tangible, clear benefits from applying evidence that's already been generated? Why can't we just, can, is there a vehicle for just scaling those things right, up nationally? So John's question, I think, let me try and uh, paraphrase it, I think is, why can we get off the manana program uh, and get down to spending money on the things that work? Uh, so why aren't we doing that? Guys. You know, I have to say one thing that we do, we, we pulled an MDRC study off the shelf on Jobs Plus. And um, we're looking for, it's a, a housing authority-based employment training and placement program. 
evidence for different cities or something, you know, random control. It was great. It worked. It was amazing. 15 years later, no one's doing it. Um, so the CEO team bring it um, to me. They, they, they come forward. They're like, look at this. We want to replicate it. And I'm like, eh, that's somebody else's idea. Why don't we try one of our new ideas? And, then, and, and it, that was my quick, maybe I should admit that. But that was my, I didn't say that out loud. Um, but that's what I was thinking. That's what I was thinking. And I think that there's a little bit of, um, in that regard, there can be some, some ego involved if you want to have the, the best new shiny example and you, know, you want to make your mark with your idea. There's, you know, so that can be, I think that plays, particularly if you're doing it in a, you know, in a, on a retail level, not on a you know, national wholesale level. The, the, other, and, and, um, the other thing I would say is, um, oh, let me end there, I'm sorry. No, I, I think your point is well taken. For years, I was so frustrated in you know all the all the evidence around Perry Preschool and Abbasidarian and these early childhood investments that had extraordinary returns, and there seemed to even be bipartisan support at some level, but nothing ever happened. You know, thank God for President Obama coming forward with with a proposal on early childhood. And but I wonder if you know an evidence-based bipartisan caucus in the Congress that gave <laughs> members of Congress regular information on the, I'll give you one example. I, I uh, talked to a senator the other day and I said, do you know about the Social Genome Project? He goes, no, what's that? And I said, this is this Brookings Institution project that shows what are the interventions at scale that help low-income uh, low Americans meet middle income by middle age across all these different programs. Fantastic, phenomenal project. Almost no one knows about it. And so I think just providing the evidence to, to members in, in, a, in a fiscal climate that's so constrained, um, you would think would help move, move toward evidence-based policy making. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you could all join me in thanking this star-studded panel. Uh,